بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Dar al-Athar al-Islamiya is especially delighted to welcome Dr. Sabina Antonini to the 23rd cultural season. I say especially not because we are showing favoritism to our, to our other wonderful speakers, but because some of our first speakers not in the present cultural season, but in the lectures that were held in the 1980s in the original site of the Dar Kuwait National Museum. The Dar has long held an interest in archeology span of South Arabia and had the pleasure of presenting to its audience the discovery of old pages of the, Co of the Holy Quran found in an attic of an old mosque in Sana'a, Yemen. In our current series of cultural seasons, we have continued to bring scholars that specialize on various aspects of Yemen. In 2017, the Friends of the Dar went on a trip to Sana'a. Tonight's speaker is one of the most prominent experts on the archeology span and the history of South Arabia. As director of the Italian archeological mission, she was from 1984 to 2013, archeologist and principal historian for the mission's excavations. She also is active in contributing to archeological efforts in Ethiopia and Saudi Arabia and has continued to publish monographs and articles. Dr. Antonini, in a lecture entitled Representations of Power in Southern Arabia in the Early Centuries CE, will be dealing with South Arabia within the context of its position in the cultural exchanges within the expanded Hellenistic world. Of course, mobile phones are also a form of cultural exchange, but their power, their power definitely can overwhelm Dr. Antonini's lecture. So we kindly ask you to turn them off and let's welcome Dr. Sabina Antonini. Although South Arabia was never included in the empires of Alexander the Great, it's too fast. Uh, or his successors, or in the Roman Empire. Hellenistic and Roman artistic movements profoundly influenced its figurative production from 2nd century BC onward. Indeed, Greek or Roman influences reached Southern Arabia directly through the trade of artworks and also through imitations and local adaptation of the style and iconography. For example, the latest of um, the three funeral statues of the king of Ausan, the king of Ausan is here, and uh, it was uh, one of the kingdoms uh, of um, Southern Arabia beside the kingdom of Sabah, Kataban, Himyar, and Hadramaut. So specifically, the, the third status of Yazdukun Farium Sharahat, the son of Madahil Salhan, the name is written on the base of the statue, dating from the first century AD, already shows a distinctive transformation in the figurative language expressing the ideology of power. By adopting the tunic and the mantle, tunica and the pallium, of Greco-Roman origin, the king of Ausan certainly broke with the iconographic canon of his predecessors. You have here his father and his grandfather, and you see that really the style of the dress is really changed. However, 
his attitude as a devotee certainly followed Southern Arabia iconography and maintained a typical sculptural style. The recent discovery in Yemen of a number of large bronze statues of loricate figures, uh, that means with curious, um, confirms how deeply the Hellenistic Roman influence transformed the communicative language of the elite in Southern Arabia. We will see in this presentation how the new power language was perfectly adapted to the South Arabian political and social context of the first and second centuries AD. South Arabia had a long tradition in the manufacture of large bronze statues. These were symbols of prestige in a broader social, political, and economic sense, but were always votive in character. And as votive statues, their natural public space was the temple. They were mainly depicted according to the typical iconography of the offerer or worshipper, a South Arabian habitus, that means the local style. Regarding the images of queerest figures found in South Arabian context, only two artworks in bronze were known to date. A fragment with the inscription at the Bainun Museum in, in Yemen, certainly part of a large statue, and the figurine of a loricate person wearing a helmet and in the act of making elevation with a patera, with a bowl, presently at the British Museum in London. But beside this um, uh, sculpture, this uh, artworks, we have an armored god with a halo, for example, here. You have a god with a cuirass, with, you see the sleeves and the clamis and the cloak and the halo, like this one. <clears throat> uh, close to the, beside to the alt an altar is represented on an alabaster fragment from the relief of Shabwa in Yemen, the capital of the Hadramaut kingdom. For this talk, I will not consider the representation of the god in military attire, but I, will, I, uh, I can add to this list of queerest figure a newly discovered large and complete bronze statue whose origin is unfortunately unknown. The work is part of the Al Sabah collection and is published in uh, the catalog of the exhibition and the, the statue is currently showing in the American Cultural Center. But before addressing the new bronze work, I would like to show you two types of queeras because it's important to date this statue. The classical queeras depicted from 5th, 4th century BC in the Greek Attic funerary reliefs was readopted in the Augustan age and became the Roman loricate statue par excellence during the imperial period. The cuirass has anatomical feature and was usually formed by two hulls joined along the sides. From the curved lower edge of the cuirass hung two or more rows of metallic lappets called pteruges, having a semicircular or rod-like shape. The Hellenistic queries used from Alexander the Great periods onward as shown in the famous mosaic of the battle between Alexander the Great and Darius. Here you have a detail of the big mosaic. Or in the statuette of Alexander the Great on horseback, both at the National Archaeological Museum of Naples, was adopted by the Hellenistic kings for their public images as military commanders and spread through the Hellenistic world. It is a corset cuirass from which one to three rows of long rectangular leather 
Terges, Lappets, Hang. A belt, the Chingonum Vitae, was worn on the cuirass and tied at the waist. This one is the Chingonum Vitae. The cuirass of the new statue and the fragment from the Bainun Museum belong to the Hellenistic type. The corset cuirass is devoid of decorations. The only depictions are the shoulder straps, epomides, used to securely fasten the two sides of the cuirass, and the cingulum vitae, a leather belt wrapped twice around the chest and tied at the stomach. The cingulum is to be understood as a symbol of command. Two layers of leather lappets hang from the curved lower edge of the cuirass. One series of shorter lappets protect the pelvis, and the second series of longer lappets protect the legs. A tunic with sleeves, called tunica manicata, was worn underneath the cuirass, and it is visible above the knee, and also the sleeves on the arms. The feet are protected by the crepides, that is, military uh, sandals. The figure has an active pose, the body weight resting onto the right leg while the left leg is lightly bent and rested behind the body. The right arm is raised and extended forward. The palm of the open hand is also facing forward. The left arm is bent at the right angle and slightly discarded at the side, as if supporting the clamis, a short mantle absent in this statue. It is unclear what the statue held in the left hand. The shape of the hand suggests a cylindrical object, possibly a sword or a spear. If the object had been a long pole or a spear with a symbolic meaning of power, the arm would have been in a higher position, like the examples below. The gesture of the figure with the arm and open hand extended forward is certainly not of a worshipper, nor does it denote a person in the act of blessing, as we are accustomed to seeing in South Arabia iconography. The arm stretched forward with an extraordinary large and firm hand belongs to an appeasing commander or to a leader demanding attention and requiring silence before delivering the ad locutio, the speech that, during Republican and Roman imper Roma, Imperial Roman times, consuls, generals, and emperors made to the troops as an encouragement before a battle or military campaign. Among the most famous examples of emperors in Quirias and performing this very gesture is the marble statue of Augustus, of Prima Porta, dated early in the first century AD, or, for example, the statue of Titus in the Louvre Museum. Similar examples are found in many historical monuments, such as the Trajan's Column in Rome. You see this one on the podium. Or the bronze statue of the Etruscan dignitary Aule Metelli, called the Orator, dating from the end of the second and the beginning of the first century BC. The hand of the Al Sabah statue collection this one, is disproportionately larger compared to the size of the body and provides a greater emphasis to the gesture. This exaggerated perspective of the extended arm and hand 
along with the active advancing posture of the body, is very effective in aesthetically communicating energetic power and determination. The face of the figure is that of a young birdless leader who still retains the delicate and refined feature of youth with a thin nose, tight lips, small and low ears, and large eyes rendered with stony lie and a hollow iris. The hairstyle consists of a compact cap of rows of regular, long, smooth, parallel locks crowning the forehead. Two concentric rows of thicker and rounded locks cover the head and the nape of the neck. The hair is retained by a hairband, tenia, that is a regal symbol. This diadem is of Hellenistic origin, as you can see in this uh, uh, Ptolemy II, the Philadelphus stat uh, statue, portrait. With regard to the facial feature of the loricate figure, it is difficult to determine whether it is in an uh, idealized portrait or the realistic portrait of a Sabean or Himyarite prince exec executed by an expert artisan influenced by Greek or Roman models. In fact, I could not find specific parallels to this portrait. As for the hairstyle, with large locks arranged in a bang covering half the forehead, it seems a generic and simplified local adaptation of Roman portraits of the post-Augustus area. Among Julio-Claudian portraits, for example, a series of portraits Emperor Claudius or, for example, the common charioteers with the influence from Nero's portraiture shows you have two portraits of Nero, the young one and the oldest one. And also in Yemen, we found an Aurus uh, golden uh, coin in Yemen. So they had a prototype. So um, shows a hairstyle comparable to that of the, our loricate statue. The Julio-Claudian classicizing style of both the birdless with a smooth, ageless face and calm, reserved facial expression and the short and ordinary hair derived from late Republican iconography and ultimately from Augustus Prima Porta type. This classicistic style became, in the first century AD, the hallmark of the Julio-Claudian emperors as well as client kings all across the empire's peripheries, as, for example, in the Middle East dynasties or kings of the Greek East. In short, the head is Hellenistic Roman, that is, the diadem, the composure, the elegance, and the dignity of the introspective expression derived from Hellenistic model of a ruler. But the vivid feature and the hairstyle is a local adaptation from Julio-Claudian models. These references, inspiring models, circulated even in southern Arabia, as evidenced, for example, by the coin of Seleucus II, found in Tamna, the capital of the kingdom of Cataban, and the local coins of Augustus. It is possible that in Southern Arabia, the adoption by Sabean or Himyarite princes of loricate statue in commanding stance as symbol of their military success and expression of power could, could be a consequence of the Elius Gallus expedition in Arabia Felix, beside the trade and relationship with the Roman Empire. The Elius Gallus expedition was in 26, 25 BC under Augustus. The relations of friendship is reported in a passage from the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, when the anonymous writer says that Caribael, legitimate king of the two nations, 
the Homerite and the one lying next to it called the Sabean. He is, uh, this Caribael is a friend of the emperors, thanks to continuous embassies and gift. So is attested that there were friend, the, 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 there were uh, collaboration between uh, the, the Roman emperors and the local aristocracy. If Caribael in the Periplus is Caribil Watar Yuanim, king, the king of Saba at Duraidan, who ruled in the second half of the first century AD, according to Daniel Potts, this king favored the Romans and also adopted Augustus' portrait on the local coins. A confirmation of this chronological parallel is provided by the fragment at the Museum of Bainun. Bainun is a city, ancient city south of Sana'a, in the highland. The inscription refers to the name of Mahtara Nazar, known in the other inscriptions always as Mahtara Nazar ibn Mahir. It is therefore a prince of Radman, of the lineage of Mahir and Khaulan, that formerly was part of Kataban on the southern plateau, whose capital was uh, Walan. I'll show you where is Bainun and Walan, Al-Misal. His kingdom date, dates back to year 5075 AD. According to Christian Robin, the fragment at the Museum of Bainun could come from the Shaddad area, whose princes were the Banu Sumusami. So we have uh, a datation for the queries from Bainun because of the inscription, the royal inscription. In the Al-Sabah collection, there are two other bronze lorikate statues. The first one, unlike the other of the same collection I showed you before, wears a short mantle, the clamis. As for the gesture, the right hand is not open with the palm facing forward as in the two other lorikate statues. Although the meaning is the same, here the gesture is more delicate and natural. I can say, I can add more close to the Augustus of Prima Porta statue. The slightly oblique posture directed the viewer's attention to the gesture and the face of the loricate person, who is an authoritative person, in this case probably a Himyarite or Sabean prince, who decided to be represented as one of his Roman or Near Eastern homologous. The third loricate statue of the Atzaba collection, unlike the other two statues with didents, has a head covered by a helmet. The iconographic scheme consisting of a helmet, helmet, weapon, the spear, armor, mantle, and military sandals seems to refer to the representations of Ares, inspired by the imperial symbolism. Ares, in fact, is the armored god par excellence with spear, shield, and helmet on his head. But his classical representation is that of heroic and divine nudity. Ares is also represented with a cuirass. However, it seems to exclude the possibility that this is a cult statue of Ares, in this case, this statue, or a statue of South Arabian armed deity. It is rather the portrait of a, a South Arabian sovereign who is represented as the god of war. The gesture of his right arm, as we have mentioned, is that of a leader addressed to the troops. In this specific case, for the Sabean or Himyaritic sovereign, it was prestigious to be represented in divine aspect, that is, divinized ruler, as did the Hellenistic princes and some Roman emperors especially those of Giulio Claudian, Antonini, and Severi families. You have uh, here the Emperor Commodores, like, uh, represented like Hercules. So uh, the presence of five exemplars 
of cuirassed statues discover in Yemen, five because of three of uh, the Al Sabah collection, one uh, uh, the Bainun uh, um, uh, statue and, uh, and the other uh, from the British Museum, shows that the image of the armored person was widespread in Southern Arabia and that the symbol of the royal authority inherited from the Hellenistic Roman custom was familiar to the South Arabian population. The fact that the representations of armored princes so far found in Yemen are all made on, of bronze, uh, until now no armored statues made of stone have been found in Yemen, it shows that they, are, they were commemorative or votive monuments and not funeraries, whose commission was certainly royal, as it is shown by the only statue with inscription of the Museum of Bainun, which bears the name of Mahtara Nazar, a prince of Radman. In addition to Lorikid statues, the Emirate princes also adopted the image of the nude hero in arms. Both models borrowed from the ancient Hellenistic tradition mediated by the Roman civilization. The best example is provided by the two colossal statues of the Himyarite princess Damaralai Yuabir and his son Taran, princes and co-rulers of Sabah and Duraidan, excavated at Nak Naklat Alamra. Is here Nak Naklat Alamra. The full reconstruction of these Two statues, along with the original fragments, are at the National Museum of Yemen in Sana'a. The iconography of the nude hero is certainly interpreted within a military context through the display of a weapon, in this case, in our case, a spear. The posture of one of the two Himyarite princes is similar to that of the Hellenistic bronze statue known as the Hellenistic prince uh, dating to the second century BC depic depicting a young nude hero. The statue was found in Rome in 1885 and uh, is now at the Museo, uh, National, uh, Roman National Museum in Rome. His left arm is extended forward to hold the spear while the right arm is held behind the body with the back on his hand on the gluteus. The posture is classical, citing the 4th century BC Lysippus heroic depiction of Alexander the Great wearing the regal handband and holding a spear. In summary, during the 1st and 2nd centuries AD, a radical change occurs in Arabia Felix in the figurative language adopted by the rulers, a change that breaks with the local tradition by adopting both the queerest military le leader and the nude hero holding a spear. The first celebrates military duties and merits while the second exhibits virile and heroic qualities of the leader. Regarding the, the place where the statues were um, displaying, I mean, uh, exposed, um, we can say that the, the, the Loriket statues, the, the three Loriket statues, unlike the fragment at the Banyun Museum, they have no inscriptions. And so uh, they were most likely placed onto an inscribed stone base, probably written in local character in Musnad. The statue, as assertive of royal power, could have been displayed in a public place, for example, on the facade of the prince's palace, or maybe as part of a group of statues in the court of a temple continuing, in this case, the ancient tradition of donating bronze statues to the temples. On the other hand, the statue of the nude hero was also imbued of a powerful authoritative symbolic value, as long as it was represented armed 
that is with a military connotation, emphasizing what the Roman calls virtus, the courage in war. We can speculate on the original placement of the new heroic statues, such as those of Nakla Talamra. According to the dedication inscribed on the chest of the statues, Damaralai Yuabir and his son Taran donated the two statues for the decoration of the palaces of the important Darani families, the princes of Kasham. The beautiful colored fresco found at Kariat al Fao in, um, in Saudi Arabia depicts a palace or a South Arabian tower house with figures uh, leaning out the windows. It's very impressive, this decoration. Uh, you may notice, notice that the main entrance accessed via a staircase here. There, uh, there is a painted niche with an ogival arch and framed by serpentine columns, inside which is depicted a statue of a nude figure with the right arm lifted to hold the scepter and the left arm bent resting on the hip. This image reproduce exactly in a mirror symmetric image one of the two heroic nude statues by Nakla Talamra. In conclusion, in conclusion, it appears that the local South Arabian elite drew on a statuary language of the victorious and valiant military leader that was created during the Hellenistic period and was later elaborated by the Roman during the later the late Republican period and fully embraced during the early Imperial age. We must add to these pictures the third type of statuary devoted to the everlasting celebration of the honored person, that is the equestrian statue represented in the South Arabian culture by the bronze horse found in Grayman owned by the Dumbarton Oaks Museum in Washington, D.C. since 1938. The statue presents three inscriptions that differ in style, content, and technique. One of the dedicatory inscriptions on the horse refers to two horse statues and two horse riders. According to an ancient Eastern tradition, it was customary in Southern Arabia to celebrate significant occurrences by dedicating two identical statues as these were positioned facing each in order to frame or surmount a grandiose access or staircase to a monument. We have, uh, for example, the putti riders, lions, uh, uh, found in uh, Tamna, um, in front of uh, a, ha a house uh, excavated by the American Foundation for the Study of Man in uh, the 50s. Or another uh, lion, for example, found in uh, Aljuba, close to, not far from Tamna. The closed iconographic comparison to the Gaiman horse is that the small statue representing Alexander riding his horse, Bucephalus, at the National Archaeological Museum of Naples. The equestrian statues, not only I have a reconstruction, not only celebrated the wealth of the elite, but served also the purpose of celebrating the athletic dexterity and military prowess of the knight prince. It is likely that following Elius Gallus' expedition in Arabia Felix and the contacts with the Roman eastern provinces, these powerful aesthetic models were adopted locally were for loyalty or friendship with the Romans uh, who maintained vast economical interest. Uh, here you have a, a map uh, with a commercial uh, route by sea. This uh, uh, actually is the old uh, uh, caravan route. 
and this one uh, by sea uh, was uh, uh, discovered uh, around the end of the first uh, century BC. So, where for loyalty or friendship with the Romans who maintained vast economical interest in the Red Sea, the local South Arabian princes adopted the iconography of the self-celebratory field commander for their official propaganda and to enhance their own personal qualities and social standing. Thank you very much.